Good morning, Austin Oaks Church. Trust you are doing well after a really sad weekend. Um, Badgers won. It's a good thing. I uh, want to let you know, if you're a guest or you're visiting us this morning, we're thrilled to have you here. We want to let you know that we're a church that strives to be simply about Jesus. We want to make sure that the gospel is front and center, that that's our central point, that's our anchor. Because when you encounter Jesus and you start to understand the message that he taught and what he delivered, it, it literally, it, it changes everything. And so that's what we're about. And in fact, that's what we're going to be talking about the next four weeks. And I've been looking forward towards this series for some time to be this, this concept of rethinking religion. Um, we're not going to be talking about the ins and outs of religion, what it is, what it isn't. We're not going to be going through all of the other religions in the world that are there, what I want to do is start to, um, start to maybe burst some bubbles of how we see Christianity or what we think we believe Christianity is or what the church is or what the church should be and all those kind of things. I want us to think about that because I know when we start talking about the word religion, Right now, as we're talking about that, I'm sure there are certain thoughts and feelings that are flying across your mind. And if we were to do a survey of people in this room, there would be at least 50 different responses. Some people would be like, what's the point of religion? Is it all about power manipulation? Is it political? Is it all just about money? Is it divisive? Do, do they support human rights? Do they not support human rights? And all these kind of things. And it's like, and where does Christianity come into it? Like, what good does it serve? And how do we know which one's right? And this and that. There are just so many things that come into our minds when we start thinking about religion. And that's what we want to talk about these next four weeks. Going, what makes Christianity different? How do we think about it? Like when you think about going to church and when you start thinking about what church is, what thoughts come into your mind? What experiences have you had with the church, good, bad, or indifferent? When people talk about the church, you think it's just simply coming to your mind like, oh, it's an organized religion. It's all this crutch, you know. Like over the years, I've talked with people and I invited people to church and, and I would hear at least these, these kind of statements. It's like, you know, I'm not going to go. It's just an organized religion. It might work for you, but it doesn't work for me. That's fine. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, don't want to go again. It adds no value to my life. I saw my parents go. I went as a kid. It didn't change anything there. So what, why, you know, it's just like there's so many things. In fact, some people would even say to me, like, Brandon, I will go back to church when I have kids. Or now that I have kids, I'm going to go to church because I want our kids to have a good moral base. We start to think all of these different things about what Christianity is. In fact, if you've been around an evangelical Christian long enough, you probably heard this statement too. Oh, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship, which is true. But in the function of our belief in Jesus, we, we embody some practices that would be defined as religion. But as Pastor Chad already said, the major distinguishing factor between Christianity and all other religions is that all other religions are our efforts to try to earn something, to try to be good enough, to try to get peace, to try to prove something. That is not Christianity. Christianity's message, Christianity's religion is grace. It's the gospel. It's what he has done for us where there's nothing that we could do. Our good enoughs will never be good enough. Our best efforts will never be good enough. It's what he did for us and that changes everything. So these next four weeks, that's what I want to talk about. And I want us to be thinking about this question. What is the point of religion? Let's think about it this way. What's the point of Christianity? Like, why does it exist? Why do we do what we do? Why do we go to church? Why do we sing songs? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Churches try pretty hard to try to recruit people or to convince people to come to church. And I don't know if you've ever seen one of these signs before, but I think this is probably the slickest PR advertising campaign ever. I don't know if you've ever seen this type of sign before. Come on. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I didn't realize I wasn't there. I think I'm going to go now. You know, like things like that, you're like, it, it, it's not too helpful. 
You know, so we start thinking about this. It's like, okay, what makes Christianity set apart? Or even we start asking the question, like, why? Why? Like, literally, like, someone tell me why do we go to church? Like, why is church such a big deal? Like, can't I just do this on my own? Or what's the point of church? And all those kind of things. Like, this is the question I want to answer this morning. Is why go to church? Why do we do this on a Sunday morning? Why do churches across the nation, across the world do this? Why has this been happening for 2,000 some years? What is at the heart of it? And I want you to be thinking in the forefront of your mind, your answers to that. And I want to tell you a little bit about my story. I remember when um, I was a young kid, I grew up in a church-going family. My parents were church-going parents, and they wanted us to be church-going kids. In fact, they even said that. We want you to look like your cousins because your cousins are good Christian boys. And so that made my brother and I immediately want to spite the whole thing. Like, no, we're not going to because we don't want to be that. And, you know, I remember just going to Sunday school when I was a little kid. And, and I enjoyed Sunday school because our Sunday school teachers were amazing. It was so much fun. We just got to play around. It was a great time. But once middle school hit, I was just like, um, Sunday is my day off from school. Like, why would I want to get up early to go to something that feels like school? Like, the value just wasn't there for me. And so my brother and I, at that point, we, we shared a bedroom, and, and it was every Sunday morning, every Sunday morning like clockwork, my, my mom and dad would be yelling, Brandon, Brian, wake up, we got to go to church. And we would pretend that we never heard them. Like, it would just be a thing. Like, every Sunday we would pretend we didn't hear them. And it got to the point then where my dad would finally get into the room and he was getting upset. He's like, you guys, you got to get up. We got to go to church. And we would pretend like we didn't hear him. Right? And so then my dad would grab our dog and throw the dog on us. And if that didn't work, he got really mad. He tried to lift the mattress and yank it, pull us out of bed. And when he finally rolled out of bed, we had about 10 minutes before church started. And we had to dress up because that's what we did in our Lutheran church. You dressed up. So we had to do that. You know, we looked very disheveled. Our, our hair we had that rooster tail thing going on. And so we grabbed some water and dumped it on our head. You know, and this is how it went. We would get to church late. And if you've ever been to, you know, still to this day, nobody sits in the front. And so what happens when ushers are trying to ush people it's like punishment. Oh, you're at church and you're late. Let us embarrass you from everybody. Walk down the front so everybody in the church can watch you walk in the seat of shame. That's what happened every Sunday. And it was like, oh, look, the Ziskis are late again. Like, that's just how it was every Sunday, every single Sunday. And then we started to sing hymns. I had no idea how to read a hymnal. And in fact, if you never read a hymnal, I think there might be some underneath your seats. You can try to grab it and read it. They have these, these like bars, I don't even know if that's what you call them, but they had like four or three lines in each rectangular box I went across the page. I didn't know that you read the first line and then you went down and read the next line and went down. I just read each line, right? Like you normally would read in a book, right? That just kind of made sense. And so that's what I did. And I'm like, what is going on? I had no idea. Then half the words, I didn't even know, right? And so I just buried my head in the hymnal and act like I was part of it. And then came the sermon. And then like, I'm just going to be honest, I wanted to listen to the sermon. I was intrigued, but then I would slowly fall asleep. And then my dad would wake me up after the sermon when the offering plate was going through, and he would slip me a dollar. And I was like, he's paying me to go to church? Like, I had no idea. And then he realized he, he would put it in the plate. So we put it in the plate. Service would over. We would stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, fight, 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 walk down the aisle, shake the pastor's hand, wash, rinse, repeat the next week. That's what we did for Sunday. And I kept going to myself, what is the point? Why, why are we doing this? Where's the added value here? Like, I don't get it. Why do I have to wake up? Eighth grade, I got confirmed. And after I've been confirmed, my parents were like, okay, listen, you, you are now moving to high school. We're going to give you the option to choose if you want to go to church or not. Well, I chose simply to attend Bayside, uh, Bedside Baptist instead of ever going to church. Because I was just like, come on, that was a joke, sleeping in. I didn't want to go to church. I was like, why would I go? Like, it does nothing for me. And then not only that, like, I was watching my parents' lives. I was like, it's not doing anything for them. It's not doing anything for me. So, like, why would I go? It just feels like a bunch of rituals and things. Like, you got to be Lutheran. You got to be Catholic. You got to dress a certain way. All these types of things. And so I just stopped going. And now you got to understand, I wasn't anti-God. I wasn't, like, full-on atheist or anything like that. I believed in God. In fact, if you were to ask me when I was a teenager, are you a Christian? My answer would be, yeah, I'm a Christian because I was baptized and confirmed and I went to church on Christmas and Easter and every now and then I would feel bad for my parents and I would go. Like, yes, I'm a Christian, but I had no idea what any of it meant. No clue. But that was it. Never went to church until things got bad in my life. When I was a junior, senior in high school, it was a rough season. 
I, I, like on the outside, like I was popular, I had friends, I was a, you know, a decent athlete, things looked good on the outside, but on the inside, man, I was hurting. Like I, I felt this void in my life, like what's, what's the purpose of life? I feel like I could never have joy and all these types of things. And so like I just did what everybody else kind of did in high school to go with the flow. Like I got myself into drinking and into drugs and, and manipulation and lying. And, and quite frankly, I couldn't quit. I got addicted to these things and nobody really knew the struggle. And I remember, like, it got so bad that I was just like, I'm feeling desperate. Like, I slipped into depression. It's suicidal thoughts were going through my head. And I was just like, man, something's got to give. There's got to be something to life. And so I went to my roots. I went back to the church that my parents took me to. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember walking into that church service. I was wearing a T-shirt, shorts, and sandals because that's how I roll. Like, that's just me. I, if, if it's not snowing, I'm wearing sandals. And I didn't think anything of it. I walked into the church on my own. My parents didn't even know I was going. I was so hurting. I needed answers. I, I wanted to know if there was hope for someone like me, right? Like, because I don't fit the mold. And I know I'm a bad kid. And I know I'm not a church-going kid. And I know I'm a letdown to my parents. And I just needed something. And I walked into the church. And I was about to enter the sanctuary. And an usher stopped me. He said, you can't come in here dressed like that. And I just sat there, I didn't stand there, I stood there, and I was just bewildered. I was like, are you serious? I was like, you're denying my, accept, like my entrance into church, which is supposed to be hope and love by the way I'm dressed? And that just formed my perspective of church. I was like, if that's church, I want nothing to do with it. If it's all about you got to look a certain way and be in a certain way and be part of the in-group and be part of this denomination and that denomination and this and this and this and that and that. I was like, I, don't, I want nothing to do with it. And then shortly after that, my grandma passed away. My grandma and grandpa had five kids. My dad was one of them. Um, three of them were Lutheran. Two of them were Catholic. And so when my grandma passed away, my oldest uncle, who was Catholic, wanted to sing Amazing Grace at his own mom's funeral. But the Lutheran pastor told him no because he was Catholic. And I was like, at that point, I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what you think church is, why we do what we do, but I know a lot of people struggle with church because a lot of things like that, some people in this room, some of you have been hurt by the church, been abused by the church. You don't fit in, you don't look this, you don't act a certain way, so you're kind of in the out crowd, all that kind of stuff. Some of you this morning, you were invited here and you came out of courtesy and you really have maybe no intention to come back, which is totally fine. Maybe this morning you're, you're wrestling with some things and you go, this is what church is, but I want to encourage you, open up your heart and try to hear what the Bible says about church rather than what you have come to define church to be. Some of you have a hunch, that hope, that maybe there's more to it. And I'm here to tell you this morning, there is way more to it than you think. There's way more than traditions. It's way more than denominations. It's way more than singing songs and collecting offerings and trying to be good and be, you know, conform to a certain moral behavior, all that kind of stuff. No, no, no. It's so much more than that. And so the question is, why do we come to church? And the answer is real simple. Because of Jesus. Because of the gospel. Because God entered human history. He came down, took on flesh to do what we should have done, to live the life that we should have lived, to pay the penalty of our sin that was rightfully ours so that we could have access and have our hearts made alive again to love him. That's why we do what we do for no other reason than that. But however, the church is so good at making secondary things primary. And we forget that it's about Jesus. This morning, this is what I want to dive into. Last week, we talked about um, ecclesia, the church, and how the New Testament, the Bible, the early church defined church. They never used phrases like, we're going to church. They, they didn't see church as brick and mortar. They didn't see church as denominations. They didn't see church as things that you just got to do. Church was defined as a group of people united around a cause, and the cause was Jesus. They united around the historical events of his death and his resurrection. And when Jesus came back from the dead, three days later, 
Like, it's not just like this biblical, mystical thing. Like, you can look at other extra historical accounts, and people would talk about this, this person named Jesus who apparently resurrected. Like, this is documented history. When they encountered him, they're like, this guy has to be the son of God. And if he is God and he did rise again from the dead, we have to listen to him. And so they were like, we love this guy. Our lives are forever changed. When they encountered Jesus, it was as if something broke. These guys were good. The, the disciples were good Jewish people, very religious. But something was radically different with Jesus. And so when they gave their lives to him, their hearts were alive. And also what we see is the birth, the dawn of the church. And we looked at this passage in Acts 2, 42. And we're like, well, what did they do? And we read this passage and we were like, this is a natural overflow, a natural response because of God's love. This is what they did. They didn't know what else to do. They devoted themselves to the teaching and to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to Jesus. They're like, we got to know him more. I, my goodness, like he came for me. Like when I like really hated him and I wanted him to die and I wanted nothing to do with him, he did this for me. While I was his enemy, he, he died for me. Like, oh my goodness, I want to know more. I've got to know more. And they devoted themselves to each other. And also if we continue reading this passage, it was like God did something so beautiful in this early church that was so unique. They gathered around the gospel so much so, this event so shaped everything that Peter, in Acts chapter 4, had the audacity to stand in front of the same religious leaders that wanted Jesus to be crucified. And he tells them in Acts chapter 4, and he's saying, listen, he's saying to them, he's like, listen, there is salvation in no one else. Like, there, there's no other religion that can save you, that can give you life, that can make your heart beat again the way it was designed to do. Nothing. Only Jesus can. There's no other name given amongst men that we could be saved. I know some people when they start thinking, read this passage, and they start thinking about all the religions in the world, they, they start to go, well, that's an arrogant statement. How can you say that Jesus is the only way? We got to look at the tenor, the voice of this passage. Peter is not like saying, hey guys, we got it, you don't. Sorry. He, he's not like trying to be like putting his thumb on. He's like, hey, we're the right people and you're the wrong people. Like, we're the good people, you're the bad people. You're the pagan sinners out there. We're like the good Christian people in here. Like, he's like, listen, like, he died and he came back from the dead. We saw him. And so, therefore, there's no other name. Like, there's no other religion. There's nothing that could even compete to this. All other religions are like, you got to do X, Y, and Z. You got to do this, and you got to do that. You got to pray five times a day. You got to give this. You got to perform this function, and that function, and this. And, and maybe, just maybe, if you're good enough, and if God's in a good mood, he might accept you into heaven. Well, how do you know you're going to heaven? I don't know. I was good, and I did enough good. Well, how much is good enough? I don't know. I was just say, I don't know. Christianity is like, no, no, he did it all. This is not arrogance. This is grace. This is God saying, listen, everyone, there's a way to be saved, and it's through Jesus. It's through him and him alone. Well, that's fine, but how, how, it sounds like it's personal preference, right? Like, you know, it's good for you. It's not good for me. It might work for him. It might work for her, but not for me. It's not my, it's not my style. It's not how I roll. Again, Peter is not saying this is not a personal preference thing. He's like, he came back from the dead. That's objective, like, he's God. And this is what sets apart Christianity from the very beginning. It's Jesus. It's him. But listen, none of this stuff makes sense unless you understand that you, apart from Jesus, are forever separated from God. Think about it, okay? Like, the Bible says these things and it's not meant to like make us feel condemned or guilty. Like we're, we're sinful people. Like we are predisposed to selfishness. 
Like, how many of you fight that? that I guess that was rhetorical. But I'm pretty sure we're all pretty selfish. Like, we really, like, like, how many of us would be terrified if people knew all of the thoughts you had? Like, why do you feel like you can't quit certain behaviors even though you want to? You feel sort of trapped in them, sort of enslaved to them, you know, kind of like a bug drawn to the light. Why do we so, so many times wrestle with a sense of purpose and desire and feel like there's got to be more? Why do people have created so many religions over all the time trying to find that answer? It's because we're separated from God. We were created to love God and be in a relationship with him. And so sin just completely destroyed that. And that's what God, this is where the gospel is so beautiful. He sent his son to make that way possible for us so that that gap, that hole, that, all those things that we wrestle with in our sin and evil desires can be completely transformed through him. If we don't understand that, none of these things will make sense. Like when we start talking about being born again or our hearts being made alive, like it's not going to make any sense. Because here's the deal. If I were to define for you what it means for our hearts to be made alive or to be born again, which is a good evangelical phrase, are you a born again Christian? It basically means this, that our hearts are finally able to love God. We are now finally able to love God. We go after so many things. We worship so many things. We pursue so many things. We have desires that are all over the place. Those were all meant to find their seat and their place in God alone. And when he came and he did this, and when the gospel makes um, room in our heart, and also we start to become alive in him, we're able to love him. The very purpose of our being, our existence, is now able to love him. So, why do we come to church? I want to suggest it's simply this reason. We come to church to learn how to love God. We come to learn to love him. That's why we're here. Let me say this. If you've never tasted and seen the love of God, if you've never been caught up in God's love, if his truth has never penetrated your heart, church will never make sense. You'll come to church, you'll hear things about how to live better, you'll hear things about being a sinner and not being good enough and all these types of things, but if his love hasn't penetrated your heart, church will never make sense. We come here to learn how to love God, to be caught up in God's love. So how? How do we learn to love God? How do we learn to love him? Well, I want to go back one step and help us understand the greatest thing we can do as human beings, the highest calling we have is to love God. When Jesus was asked in the gospel, so what's the greatest command? Like out of all the religious rules and all the things that are there, Jesus, tell us what's the greatest command. And Jesus says, you want to know what the greatest command is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And then right after this, he says in the second, it's just as great as the first, love your neighbor as yourself. If this is the greatest command, that means this is why we exist. Is to love him. No other religion, no other method, no other program, no other thing can make you love God. Only the love of God can make you love God. That's it. And so when we come to church, we come to learn how to love because at its basic core, love is a response Love is a response to something. We need to understand God's love. We need to be captivated by God's love. 
right? We don't love out of obligation. We love because God first loved us. And so when the gospel is revealed, we see it in its beauty. We see it in its, its radicalness that God would send his son to do this when I could care less about him. Like, really? That's too good to be true. Like, he loves me even when I still stink. I almost said a different word. He, like, see, like, look, I'm a sinner right there. I almost said something that would have been like, a, well, we're going to leave the church. He just said a four-letter word. Okay, I'm going to stop. Just move on. Like, like, he loves us regardless. If I'm faithful, regardless, like, I don't have to, like, I, I don't have to, like, prove it or earn it. Like, here's the problem. Human beings, we're reciprocal. We, we love by a give and take. We don't understand unconditional love. Very rarely do we love people unconditionally. It's like, oh, you're going to give me, so therefore maybe I'll give back. Like, I'll love you when you do this. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And so we think that way with God. And that's why all the other religions are man-made. They're all fake. They're all false because they embody that lifestyle. But with Jesus, it's the complete opposite. I love you. I don't care if you love me back. I still love you. There's nothing you can do to make me love you more. And there's nothing you can do to make, you, make me love you less. I love you. When that grabs our heart, things change. This love is so powerful that Paul, in the letter to the churches in Ephesus, he wants them to understand something. He's like, listen, this is such a big deal. When you gather together, this is what I want you to experience. This is what I want you to understand. And Paul's praying for a bunch of churches, new churches in, in modern-day Turkey. He goes, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in your religious performance, will begin to earn God's favor. Paul's like, listen, like, I am praying, I'm on my knees praying for you that when you come together with all the saints, that you would be rooted and grounded in God's love. When you gather, the love of God is central. You cannot learn to love God unless you are rooted in God's love. But check this out. He goes, I like, listen, so that you may have strength together with everyone to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It, it's like you can't even fathom this. Name me another religion that describes God this way. Because Christianity really isn't a religion. It's, it's, it's totally different. I want you to be rooted and grounded in the love of God. Where did Paul even get this? Where did the early church even get this statement? Like, where am I getting this from saying that this is why we gather church? We, we get it from Jesus himself. In John 15, one of the most popular you know, teaches of Jesus, the vine and the branches. I want you to, to see this with me. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser, and every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, Jesus is the vine, we represent the branches, right? So it's just this beautiful image of how connected we are to Jesus. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. You're like, you could read this and be like, see, it's about what we do. Like he wants us to produce fruit. So I got to try to produce fruit. I got to try to be good. I got to try to conform to be a Christian. And he's like, no, 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 we're thinking mechanical. Uh, we're thinking like programmatic here. What Jesus is saying is like, no, growth and transformation, fruit bearing comes organically. And so check this out. He goes on to say, it's like, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. 
by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So you're like, okay, he's still talking about fruit. He wants us to perform. He wants us to, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Here it is. Abide in my love. The Greek word here for abide is meno, which basically means this, make your home in. I'm a simpleton. This makes more sense than the word abide. Jesus is like, make your home in my love. Get comfortable in my love. Talk about my love. Reflect on my love. Saturate yourself in my love. Abide in my love. And when you're doing that, you're abiding in me. And guess what's going to naturally happen? Fruit will happen. The change will happen. And you can simply say that means we will begin to understand what it's like to love God. He's like, listen, when you come together as a church, primarily your number one function should be to abide in my love. Come here to make your home in God's love so that we can learn how to love him. Because the next teaching, Jesus goes on here. He's like, listen, you know, no greater love has than one lay down in life for your brothers. Love your brothers. Talking about how we should serve other people. But it's a direct reflection of our love sitting in his love and our love for him. So when we come to church, we should focus on his love for us instead of our behavior. We should focus more on his love for us than our acceptance of ourselves and thinking, does he accept me? Does he not accept me? Have I been good enough? Am I not good enough? All these types of things. The church, like I said, has done a really good job of focusing on the fruit. That we put the cart in front of the horse and we make people feel guilty and burdened when they're not doing enough. When they're not producing enough fruit. When they don't look Christian enough. We're like, come on, you got to do it, you got to do it, you got to do it. Jesus is like, time out. Just make your home in my love. Yeah, but what about this? Yeah, but over that? Yeah. The one who rose from the dead probably knows a little bit better how this works than we do. Now, I want to say this because this, this is not easy. Like this is good, fun preaching. It's fun to preach about God's love. But I know how hard it is to receive God's love. And I want you to hear this. It takes faith to receive God's love. It takes faith. Listen, it takes faith to believe that God loves you just the way you are. How many of you are struggling with that right now? How many of you had a week where you're like, if God only knew? How many feel like you haven't been Christian enough or good enough to be in church? It takes faith to believe that God loves you just because he loves you. I mean, that's the power of God's love. And we get to choose how to respond to his love. Just like our kids, if you have kids, your kids get to choose how to respond to mom and dad. Even though you love them, they get to choose how to respond back to you. You can't force them to love you. You can't make them feel obligated to love you, even though sometimes that's how we think it works in the church world. Hey, God, I'm here. I'm here. I love, I love you. I love you because you commanded me to love you. You said the greatest commandment is to love you, so I, I love you today. <laughs> how do you think my wife would feel? If I went, babe, let's go out to eat on Thursday. Thursday's date night. I'm just doing it because I have to. I'm obligated. We're married. I'm here. I love you. Did you have a good time? <laughs> Embers of love right there, right? It's like, couch is calling. Do you think God wants us to love him back out of obligation and duty? 
no. And that's why this is hard. And his love is forever demonstrated and displayed through Jesus Christ. Forever. Forever. Listen, religion tells you to go and change before you can be right before God. The gospel changes you by showing you the love of God. It's totally different. The gospel produces a new kind of desire and obedience inside of us. And we're going to talk more about this next week. Paul, I'm going to end with this, this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you've ever been around the church world, 1 Corinthians 13, if you've ever been to a wedding, you might have heard this passage. It's like the love poem, love is kind, love is this, love is that. And a lot of times I use it in marriage and all this kind of stuff, but really the, the, the situation of this letter was in church conflict. Paul was trying to bring unity to this church that was thinking they were more religious or better than other people in the church or those on the outside of the church. I mean, there was gender issues. There was race issues. There was crazy sexual issues where the father-in-law or the son was sleeping with his dad's, you know, other wife. I mean, it was just, it was jacked up. It was this mess in the church. And Paul wants to bring them in. He's like, listen, I want you to understand when you come, there's one thing that's central. It's like if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, because there are people in the church saying we're more spiritual than everyone else. Like we speak in tongues more than anybody else. We, we got these things. Like we're the ones who raise our hands when we sing. Like everyone else doesn't. We're more spiritual. Like He's like, listen, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am just noise. I'm just a really annoying sound. And if I have prophetic powers to understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, I'm the smartest Christian around. I know the Bible inside and out. I have memorized numbers. You should come to my class. It's amazing. I will tell you everything you need to know in life. And if I have all the faith so as to remove mountains, you speak to that mountain and make that mountain move. Like, ooh, look at that person. They got faith. They're like, oh, Paul's like, no, no. So as to remove mountains. But if I have not love, I am nothing. It's like all of these other things mean nothing if it's not rooted and centered in love. Even if I was a martyr, even if I was so generous and I gave everything I had away, but if I have not love, I gain nothing. So why do we come to church? We come to church to make our home in his love, so that we can learn how to love him. And as we love him, church, we begin to love others the way he loved us. It was uh, 2000. I was 19 years old, college student, coming into my sophomore year. In college, I just blew up my shoulder from playing baseball and and I still, you know, like, like I said, in, when I was in high school, I was dealing with drugs and alcohol and all this type of thing. And, I, and the addiction just got worse. Like I was being threatened to be put on academic probation. And everything was falling apart in my life. Again, externally, looks good. Internally, horrible. Horrible. It was like everything that I thought, this is, this is life. I'm going to live it up. It's college. It's party and this, you know, all this kind of stuff. And just on the inside, it was just wreaking havoc. And out of nowhere, my dad calls me up. Now, you got to understand, my dad and I, we didn't get along. He never calls. He, we never talk. He called me up, and he's like, son, sounds like you're having a rough time. I'm like, glad you called, dad. And he goes, I really think you should go to church. you got to remember my church experience. Yeah, dad, thanks for the awesome advice. I'll just do that. When we got off the phone, it was as if something that was just like, maybe I should try. So my pitching partner his roommate, Michael Beckman, was a Christian, and he always invited me to certain church events or campus ministry things, and I would always say yes, and I would always stand him up. And so I called him up, and I was like, Mike, I need to go to church. You got to understand, I'm a Lutheran. That's how I was born and raised, Lutheran. I never heard of a free church. Some of you might not even know we're a free church. Like, if you're like me, I thought free church meant no, no offering. <laughs> I can go. I'm good with that, you know. Um, not the case. And uh, I, get to, I, get, yeah. I, I get into the church. I'm looking for the thrones. 
I see no thrones. I'm looking for the dudes in the robes. I don't see no robes. I see a red Gibson guitar and some drums, and I'm going, what did I just get myself into? Like, I had no idea. I had no idea. It was, the service was happening, and I didn't even know it was happening, right? And also, I'm hearing this message about grace and things, and it was as if my heart was starting to, like, the, the calluses around my heart just started to, like, kind of, like, break and fall. And, like, I don't cry. I just started weeping because I was hearing this message that God loves me regardless. And the whole time I kept going, no, that's not true. There's no way. If God only knew what I did in my life, there's no way he could love me. There is no coming back from this. He doesn't even know the pain and the hurt that I caused and everybody around me and all this kind of stuff. So I was broken, moved, something was happening. I followed up with a pastor. We go to a coffee shop, and, and he's talking to me about Jesus. And I, and I, for, I interrupted. I was like, listen, you got to understand something. I want you to know where I'm at. It's like I'm on the verge of killing myself. Like this, this, is, this is hopeless. Like don't give me this religion. Blah. Like you got to give me something. And he started talking about Jesus and the gospel. And it was like, I've never heard it before. What I was longing for and looking for and desired for all of these years and didn't even know, the gap, the void in my heart, the things that I wrestled with when I was alone in bed, drunk or high or whatever, just wrestling with these things. And it was just like, God was speaking through him right to my heart. I love you, Brandon. I paid the price for your sin. There's life. And he goes, you want to pray? <laughs> and I was just like, um, we don't pray out loud. Like the only thing we do when it comes to pray is we just sing the amen. Uh, so I don't really want to do that here. <laughs> he was like, you, you could just pray. Just, just say your thing. Just speak your heart to him. I'm like, God, <laughs> hey. And, and, and I just like basically I was just like, Lord, I. I don't understand, but I know there's something that you, you did something for me and that you're giving me a chance and I receive this gift of grace, this life. And I remember praying that prayer, you know, out loud and, and it wasn't even the words, it's just, it was the heart. And after I prayed and I said, amen, it was just like the, the pastor looked at me across the table and he was just like, because before I prayed, like I was like in tears because I wanted to die. I said amen, and I had tears of pure joy. It was like God's love just dumped on me, and it forever changed. And I was like, Lord, if this, if this is it, everybody's got to know about this. I share all of that this morning because I want to end with this point. I want you to walk out of here. If you get anything, this is what I want you to get is this. There is nothing, there is nothing that I could do to make God love me more. And there's nothing that I can do to make him love me less. Maybe this morning, this is the first time you heard this kind of message. And it's like, wow, I had no idea this is what church was. I'm with you. Maybe this would be the morning where you just receive the gift of grace that he's given you. You don't have to fully understand it. But what you've got to do know is that when Jesus touches your life, when his love gets your heart, game changer. Changes everything. So I want to encourage you wherever you're at, say yes to Jesus. Say yes. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. And it has nothing to do with religion. Because it is a relationship. It has nothing to do with what you can do. It has everything to do with what he did for us. Father, we come to you humbled. Humbled knowing that in our humanity, we try so hard to be good. We try so hard to be right. We try so hard to prove ourselves, to get worth and self-esteem and all these things. Lord, we try so hard to find purpose. We've made so many idols. We worship so many things. And the answer is in you. It's Jesus. 
So, Father, I just ask that wherever we're at this morning, you would speak to our hearts. You're the Holy Spirit. You know where we're at. You know what each one of us needs to hear this morning. I ask, Lord, that you would do that. Lord, we just pray that we would make our home in your love. We want to be a church that is known to be caught up in your love and that is passionately striving to learn how to love you well. We pray this in Christ's name.